to introduce Taye more formally. Uh, she's an accomplished writer, playwright, TED speaker, and, 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 and. Uh, Taye was born in London and raised in Massachusetts in the US. She's the, as she said, the elder of twin daughters in a family of academics. She graduated summa cum laude, uh, which is very high if you guys don't know, honor when you graduate, um, with a BA in American Studies from Yale University and holds a Master of Philosophy in International Relations from Oxford University. Taye sees herself as part of a generation that possesses, quote, a willingness to complicate Africa, namely to engage with, to engage with, critique and celebrate the parts of Africa that means most to them. Taye is of Nigerian and Ghanaian descent. And as she said, her name means first twin in her mother's native Yoruba. And Selassie means God has heard in her father's native Uwe. And without further ado, did I get it right? Very, I, very close. Okay, very, close. Very close. <laughs> oh, so I, I think everybody knows with that introduction um, why you're so apt, and so right that you give our masterclass. Here are a bunch of Dutta Charita who really tried to unpack Indonesia for the world um, yeah. as you were doing for Africa. Um, so, so with that, I pass it over to you with our thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen and um, Sarita and you wonderful storytelling ambassadors. <laughs> I, um, it is always a deep pleasure for me to talk about storytelling because it is at the very center of my life. I, I was saying that my name needs to um see and taste the world and the best way that i know for doing that has been through stories most of the stories that i tell uh these days in my work as a novelist and an essayist and a speaker and so forth are somehow to do with my continent with global politics with identity um the things that i in many respects studied at school but most of what I know about storytelling, I realize I didn't learn at school at all. It's something that I didn't uh, realize actually until until uh, doing a bit of reflection. When I was in the schools that Stephen just named, trying to you know get good grades to make my tiger mother proud, I was mostly concerned with the academic version of storytelling where the mission is to make a point, but not necessarily to communicate one. And so it turns out that after all of that education and all of those student loans, I entered the world um, not in touch with my storytelling capacity, though very much so endowed with my storytelling passion. And so what I found that I did almost without realizing it, is I stepped away from the kind of formal academic version of, of communication that I had learned. And I taught myself something else. There are two stories that I've told, two pieces of communication that I feel have touched the world in the way that I wished. One of them Stephen just quoted from, it's an essay that I wrote in 2005, so a long time ago now, about a demographic of people or a kind of experience that I called Afropolitan. So Stephen just quoted a bit from that essay, which was about African people who very much so like the, the young people I imagine you to be. And I did a little bit of reading about Indonesia before coming to this workshop. I My sense is that the plurality and the diversity, the multiplicity that we have on the African continent is so reflected in, in Indonesia and in, in, its, in, its, um, in its richness. But that wasn't, that is not a story that was being told in 2005. Most of the stories that I read and saw and heard about Africa 
were, no, stories is already generous. It was just one. It was a story of tragedy and lack and war and conflict and suffering and hunger and corruption. And that single story, as my colleague Chibimanda Adichie has called it, uh, weighed heavy on my heart. So in 2005, without really knowing what I was doing, I set about to tell a different story about the Africa that I know, the Africans I know and from whom I come. That essay that I wrote then has 1,000 words in it, but everybody really just remembers one, and that word is Afropolitan. That's the name um, and the shape that I gave to the experience of contemporary Africans such as myself, who had, as Stephen just quoted, and have this deep sense of connection to a country or countries on the continent alongside a perhaps cosmopolitan identity and or way of looking at the world. So I wrote this essay about being an Afropolitan. And I wrote it just after I finished grad school and I expected it to be read by exactly as many people as read everything else I wrote in grad school, which is four or five. <laughs> and instead, that essay went viral um, in the early days of internet virality. And I was left to ask myself why. I'd written much smarter things, I felt, but this one little essay written in the first person, in I voice, in my voice, traveled the world. It touched so many hearts and it changed so many minds. And when I started to ask myself why, why did that story about being an Afropolitan touch so many people? I came to understand something about communication, about storytelling, about my own writing practice, which is what I wanted to share with, with you um, gifted storytellers today. I call these the A, B, C, Ds of storytelling or of communication. A is for authenticity. B is for brevity or briefness. C is for clarity and D is for dignity. So authenticity. A. I wrote this essay about myself, and this is not what I've been trained to do. In the academy, in the institution, you're always at Yale, where Stephen and Abdul Rahim met, you're always using this disembodied third person. One thinks, one could suggest. And coming out of that experience, I found myself asking, but where am I in that one? When do I get to unmask myself and tell the story as myself, instead of hiding behind data and stats and references? What is the story that I can tell that is unique to and authentic to me? So that essay, again, was the first thing, if you can imagine, that I'd ever published that was just authentic. It wasn't perfect. It's just what I knew based on how I'd lived, at that time, what I knew based on how I lived when I wrote it. Um, and that kind of authenticity, that it was honest, that it was personal, that it was flawed, that it was imperfect, and so therefore that it was human, is a big part of why my Afropolitan essay, I think, became my first real engagement with the world. And it taught me something about the power of authenticity and of using authentic stories to communicate just about anything. Shortly after I wrote that essay, I was asked to speak in Italy. And I speak Italian and I was asked to speak at a conference about energy, about electricity. So I prepared this very impressive presentation to give in Italian about the importance of strong electricity in Africa. So where my parents come from in Nigeria and Ghana, I don't know if you have this problem anywhere in Indonesia, but the electricity goes off all the time. We call it losing light. You're just having your dinner and all of a sudden 
do, 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 the lights go off and you're just plunged into darkness. And then here come the roar of the generators, which are, you know, spewing diesel into the environment. It's an absolute mess. And so I was happy to speak at this Italian conference about the importance of a steady electricity supply in Ghana and in Nigeria. I prepared my presentation on my laptop once again, in Italian, many of you are multilingual. I know you speak more than two languages, but Italian is the only language that I could give a presentation and still I was quite nervous. And I opened my laptop to give this presentation about the importance of electricity. And my laptop died. Gone were all <laughs> of the points I intended to make about data on energy supply in Ghana and Nigeria. And I was just standing there blinking in front of this Italian audience. And I remembered that A, authenticity, what I had learned from writing this essay about Afropolitans. And so I told the story. I told the story based on who I am and how I lived when I wrote it and when I told it. And it was this, I said, you know, my mother is a pediatrician. She spent her entire life training to heal specifically children. My mother comes from rural poverty. She had absolutely nothing growing up. And as is true for many clever Africans, medicine was her way out. But for her, being a doctor is about a lot more than just entering the middle class. It's about saving lives and it's about healing children in a very profound way. And one day when I was with my mom in Accra, I told this audience in Italy, she went to the, the clinic and she came home in tears. And I asked her, you know, what happened? Did you, did you lose a patient? And she said, no. And you can imagine this was years ago, but this, this story is even more salient in this era. She said, I lost a hundred vaccines. I had vaccinations to give these children which would have kept them safe from malaria, which is killing them when it shouldn't be. But the electricity went out in the clinic for so long, the uh, vaccinations must be kept cool um, as we will all learn in the months ahead. And she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it because of the electricity supply in, in Ghana where she works. And that's why she's cried. I've never seen my mother cry um, about, she, she's just a stalwart Nigerian woman, but that broke her heart. That's the story that I told in order to convince this, you know, corporate group that electricity in West Africa was um, a huge concern and that keeping that um, power supply consistent with sustainable means was, a, was a, a profound priority. I just spoke authentically. It was personal, it was honest, and it worked. And from, from that day on, I, I knew that any story that I tell has to be authentic. I came to understand also that it has to be brief. Um, brevity, the word we use in English for describing something quick, is not my strong suit, <laughs> as you are about to find out. But it is something that I have learned to be fundamental to the telling of a good story. I teach uh, a lot of creative writing workshops. As, as you know, I've written a novel and writing fiction is still one of the great, great joys of my life. When I'm teaching creative writing workshops, I always begin with a quote written in 1657. It is the first sentence in a letter and it says, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. And the first time I heard that, I understood the difficulty, the challenge, and the value of brevity. It very simply takes longer to write less. It takes more time to make your story shorter. And yet it is always, in my view, time well spent. Um, to make something brief is not to make it diminished or diluted. It is to ensure that your story is distilled. So nowhere was this more um, obvious for me in my own journey as a storyteller than when I gave the TED talk. 
a TED talk can not go past 15 minutes. And I, you know, I'd seen TED talks before, obviously, before I gave one, but I hadn't quite imagined that at the front of the stage when you're giving the talk there's a timer that starts running down as soon as you start speaking so the whole time you're giving the talk you're watching your time running out and they give you like a short grace period they don't quite start playing the orchestra music as they do at the academy awards but close and it took me i just spent so much time trying to get this one idea to fit into 15 minutes 15 minutes communicated in 15 minutes but that brevity the fact that that talk is short means that it is the story i have told that has been heard by the greatest number of people in the world um over three million people have seen that talk i know you've done me the honor of watching it yourselves and i am convinced that that story has had the greatest reach because it is the shortest thing I have ever written. So we've got A for authenticity, B for brevity, and then C for clarity. So when I say clarity, I am talking about being very clear what we mean with every word that we use. When I gave that TED talk, I was speaking about where we come from. Do we come from countries? Do we come from nations? Do we come from states? Are we shaped by religion? Is our identity formed by family? Before I was able to really engage an audience in answering those questions, I had to define what I mean, what I meant by these words. What is a country? How do we define a state, a nation? And a nation is a great one. Some people think a nation is a country. Some people think a nation refers to an ethnic group that can live within a country. What is a state? Is it just what we circumscribe by sovereign borders? We use these words as if everybody knows what they mean. But when we pause to get very clear, to insist upon clarity, in the use of language, I find we always get closer to deeper meaning. We always deepen our sense of meaning as the individual storyteller, but we also create communal meaning for the community of listeners, for the audience. And so for me, that C in my A, B, C, Ds of storytelling is perhaps almost the most fundamental. It is so important to me when I'm telling a story to be very clear about what I mean by every word that I use when I know that those words can have shape-shifting meanings. Um, and this is all the more important because the stories that I tell, the writing that I do, the thinking that I share, is mostly around identity, it's around movement, it's around place and peoplehood. And so in my mind, one must be clear about what he or she means by, for example, expat. In Lisbon, Stephen and I are called expats, but my Angolan nanny was called a migrant. Why is she not an expat? She has also expatriated from Angola, but she is a migrant and Stephen and I are expats. When I was in the United States, I was an immigrant. I wasn't an expat. Nobody ever said, look at these lovely Nigerian expats. It was always, these are African immigrants. And so I have lots of questions about how we get clear on the difference between expat, migrant, immigrant. Is there a difference between displaced and unplaced? Is there reason to clarify the distinction between asylum seeker and refugee? These words that populate the discourse that I work in are slippery. And so clarity to, to be very clear about what we mean and why we choose the words we do is fundamental to my practice of storytelling. How we choose between different words, 
How do we choose between different words? If A is for authenticity, B is for brevity, C is for clarity, D is for dignity. And that is a concept that motivates my understanding of why we tell stories at all. If I'm trying to choose between this word and that word, between expat and migrant, between immigrant, between someone in movement, between traveler and, and refugee, I always try to choose the word grant subject, my subject the most dignity. I'm always looking for a framing, for a language that will extend to the audience, to my audience, the most dignity. And I'm always looking for language that will insist in the community of listeners, um, of which I'm a part, upon dignity for every single one of us. And this may sound obvious, but it is not always easy. Last summer, as did many of us, I found myself in many a debate about a movement in the United States called Black Lives Matter. And I had, and unfortunately, because we were all in the midst of the beginning of the global pandemic, most of these conversations were not live. They were, they were happening via social media. But many people were, um, let's say, mm, made uncomfortable by the language Black Lives Matter. And so even there, I found myself kind of applying my A, B, C, Ds. I thought, how do I engage with this? Okay, let me be authentic. Let me start from what I know based on who I am and how I've lived at the moment that I'm, that I'm sharing. So I said, you know, for me, I don't live in the United States right now. My family is not African-American. I would like to take off the mask and be very clear about who I am as the person speaking. I'd also like to be brief, you know, I'll keep this to an Instagram caption and not a 15 page essay, although I had that much to say on the subject. And I'd like to be clear. I'd like to say that for me, when we say something like black lives matter, well, let's just define matter, <laughs> just matter, not matter more, not matter most, just matter. And let's have this conversation in a context of dignity. So let's not shy away from saying, of course, all lives matter, human lives matter. Let's extend dignity into the community in which this conversation is unfolded, but make sure that we are clear about what we mean. And though that those sort of as guiding principles in that moment of rather fraught conversation um, really helped me, A, B, CD, when I started telling my own stories about my experience with, um, again, I'm speaking of this moment last summer because it's fresh in my mind, my experiences of prejudice and bias, my experiences of privilege. Um, when I began sharing those stories and introducing them into this discourse, I just held fast to these principles. A, authenticity, B, Brevity, C, clarity, and D, dignity. I think that it's, you know, it's easy to, when you're telling a story, and I know this because I write fiction, so many of the stories I tell are not true. <laughs> I just make them up. But I'm always, I say, talking about what I believe to be a truth in humanity, of humanity. Um, and so I'm very careful to ensure that the stories I tell will do two things that I've mentioned and that's touch hearts and change minds. I know that in my own journey, the storytelling that I've done has encouraged me to, to ask myself these questions. And, and, I, and it's what I would share, share with you. You know, acknowledge who's speaking, that's you. Speak from your experience. That, that's what makes your, your, your story authentic. Take the time to distill your idea, to distill the essence of your narrative. 
into something that is brief, into something that's clear. And this makes your story accessible. And then I say, you know, choose the language in Indonesian, in English. It doesn't matter what language you're speaking, you have options. Choose the word that dignifies your listener. And this is what makes your story transformative. If there's anything that I can think to share with a, with a community such as yours, you know, Sarita ambassadors, you are all master storytellers already. It's, it's this, this is what I've learned. Um, and it would be my pleasure if you're keen to do a bit of work around these ABCDs with you. I'll just make sure that that's okay. I'll ask Stephen if I have his permission. I think they're keen. I just want to make sure, Tika, all good. You're your star. Um, I wanted to just make sure that Tika is okay. Let her have a breather. Yeah, of course, of <sighs> course. I, I will tell you all, I tried to keep that presentation under 30 minutes. Brief. <laughs> Taya, I, I, but I not got, easy. <laughs> that, that was perfect. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You've given us so much to think and talk on. Um, let's get stuck in. I'm sure there, oh. there's a lot of stories that, that want to emerge. Good. So what I, what I wondered if we could do is if um, one of you at a time would volunteer and tell us all the story. And then if we could pick one of those ABCDs, you choose, you tell me, I'm going to tell this story and I'm going to seek in telling it to focus on authenticity, brevity, clarity, or dignity. And then we'll see, we'll see how it works. Will somebody volunteer to tackle one of those pillars of storytelling? With raise, use the oh, button to raise your hand. A reaction. I mean, I always tell my creative writing workshop participants, I will choose people at random. <laughs> so it's, it's always better if you self-select. <laughs> Oddly, they're, they're shy tonight. What's up? Yeah. I also, uh, I just want to say that uh, just as an aside, Willie gives his apologies. Um, he lost his cat and he's very sad. And so for those of you to reach out to him and uh, he's quite upset. So anyway, Willie would be raising his hand right now. So be like Willie. Be like Willie. Or Taya can choose because they seem to be shy tonight. Okay, I'm going into the full gallery view. <laughs> um, these letters E-L, is it pronounced L? Yeah, I yeah. think darling. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm going. L. Elsa Thessalonica Nisha. <laughs> yes, oh okay. my God. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. You're up, my dear. Will you will you tell me which of those um, concepts you would like to take on? Uh, okay, maybe authenticity, brevity. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Tell us an authentic <laughs> story. Okay. Um. Okay. For uh, brevity, is quite hard. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, like I said before, that I my name is L. I like to be called as L because. Yes, it's a unisex name. I like to be neutral, although my pronoun is she, ha. I'm, I'm still identified as female, not non-binary, but there are many things in my life that I just want to be gray. And the other things that I want to be gray, it's also the culture in me. I love being culturally ambiguous because I'm mixed race and my name is so many uh, culture in my name. And it's really nice to be culturally ambiguous because it's really fun to see when someone just just really uh, surprised when they see, oh, I understand this culture. Oh, I can speak this language. Even when someone talks shit about me in other language and then I reply them in the exact language and oh my God, their flabbergasted face is just, that's the face that I want to see. So, 
Uh, there are so many things that I do to be culturally ambiguous. Uh, for example, uh, number one is I love learning languages. So being able to communicate with other people in uh, some language and also open up new horizon when I get to know uh, a language. Because before, since I was a child, it's like my life is just Anglo-centric. And now when I can speak a language, it's the world is not just about America, not just about Britain, it's not just about English language. And then the second thing uh, that I do to be culturally ambiguous, it's also inspired by Trevor Noah, if you guys know Trevor Noah, is accent. I love doing accent and impression. So it's just fun sometimes to change my accent depends on whom I was talking to. Sometimes when I talk to my Indonesian friends, uh, I, some of my friends say, oh, your accent is too intimidating. And I said, oh, okay, fine. Then I will like tone down my accent. It's, it's because my friend wants to be honest to me. Sometimes they think that my accent is intimidating. Okay, I, I will change my accent. And then the third thing is my fashion. I like to be uh, really expressive with uh, my fashion. So someone can't really pinpoint where I come from. So yeah, it's, it's really nice for me to be culturally ambiguous uh, because it's, it's just fun first. And second, uh, it's just so hard for someone to put me in the stereotypical boxes and it's really lower the judgmental comments such as, uh, where do you really come from? I, it's really annoying, <laughs> this question. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, can I just give you a <laughs> Zoom round of applause? Thank, I'm sorry that I picked on you. I was, I was you know, forced to do it. But um, right. that's I love, I love what you said, what you've just shared about um, cultural ambiguity. I've never thought about it that way. Um, but that is something that I value as well. May I give you a bit of feedback? Yes, sure. Okay. I would, so we're, we're working with authenticity, yeah? And, and everything you said clearly came from the heart and, and, and is obviously and, and viscerally, um, you really, listening to you, I really feel the enthusiasm and the truth of what you're saying. If you were telling a story like that again, thinking about authenticity, I would do two things, if I may. I would consider what, one of the words that, I, that comes to mind when I speak of authenticity is vulnerability. Yeah, this is something that um, coming from, uh, you, you know, just a family where we always present well in public, it did not come naturally or easily to me to make myself vulnerable when, when storytelling in public. And so I would always tend to only give positive examples. I would share, this is what I like, this is what I'm good at, this is what works. But when you make yourself vulnerable and add to your story, perhaps a hint of what's difficult about cultural ambiguity, alongside with everything you just said, what's something that's been, that's been hard for you? Has, has there been a moment when, was there a moment that might have been a bit difficult or a bit painful that sent you on this journey towards cultural ambiguity? When you can share those um, more vulnerable moments in your storytelling, I think that those become ways that, that your listener can really connect. Not only, not to say that it has to be tragedy and sorrow start to finish, as I said, we're not in the business of telling single stories, but when you open those um, when you show your little vulnerable points, that's sometimes where the listener gets in. So I would love to hear in your story about your embrace of cultural ambiguity, your triumphant and exuberant embrace of <laughs> cultural ambiguity. Perhaps if there has been something in that journey for you that made you feel vulnerable. That, that's, that's my first little bit of feedback. Elle. And then number two, whenever I'm teaching authenticity, whether it's in prose or communication, I always say on authenticity and clarity, be specific. Can you give us a specific anecdote? So you were talking about doing accents with your friends. Can, can we hear the accents? Will you, will you tell us the <laughs> accent? Will you, will you tell me the accent that your friends find intimidating? And then tell me the accent you switch into 
to make them feel more comfortable. Well, no, I know it makes you a little more vulnerable. It's true, but it will it will deepen it will deepen the impact of your story. Okay, tell me what you think about this feedback. Okay. Uh, so like about the accent, uh, this is the way I speak to myself since I was little. Um, because at, at school I learned uh, British English and then I try to aim for uh, contemporary RP accent. But then, I don't know, in, in Indonesia, uh, American accent is more uh, famous. So when I speak like this, I tend to get uh, mocked or my friend said, oh, you, you sound so intimidating, you sound so posh. And then, yeah, uh, I, I try to speak like Kim Kardashian, like, oh my God, seriously, do you think that I will sound better with this accent? Okay, then I will speak like this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't feel like it's me when I speak like that, but if it makes my friends that told me the truth comfortable, then I will, I will do it for my friends. And uh, also about the um, vulnerability when being culturally ambiguous, it's actually, I start to want to be culturally ambiguous because when someone asks, where do you come from? They want to know about my family background. And actually, I don't like to talk about my family. And many people like really want to know where your dad or mom come from it's like you just assume that I have family you just assume that I have parents and then when I say oh um, I'm not close with my family and then they will ask oh what happened to your family I just can't say to the public that oh yeah they abandoned me when I was a child and it's it's not something that I want to talk about I can say that oh they died but they they're dead to me but they don't die in real life so yeah being culturally ambiguous made me uh made me feel that oh it's it's easier to talk to people than i just say oh yeah i'm from this country this country this country so yeah it's i understand that i understand that <laughs> um it's 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 kind of a protection yeah <laughs> like a protection. i understand that. i understand <laughs> that. well 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 thank you for that thank you for sharing that because um that that kind of authenticity again vulnerability if you will and the specificity mm -hmm. your kardashian accent is excellent um it really it deepens the story for me and it, it helps me understand why you've reached for for what you've reached for and and i can relate uh, i can relate i i think i i realize now that i've also adopted a kind of cultural ambiguity again i didn't know that was the phrase but it is as a protect as a protective mechanism so that i i also could Stay, steer clear of questions that make me uncomfortable about my personal background. So, so when you share that with me, it's, it's really touching because I realize, yeah, I, I, I sort of do that too. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Would you like thank to choose you. who? Would you like to choose who goes next? Okay. I'm really curious about Natalia because I never met Natalia before in real life. So I want to know your story. <laughs> Fantastic. Natalia, before you start your story, will you tell us if you would like to work with brevity, clarity, or dignity as a, as a kind of organizing principle? Uh, well, <laughs> brevity is, is really going to be hard because I still don't know what, what, what I need to talk about. That's fair. <laughs> uh, clarity maybe <laughs> okay okay which which means when you tell us what you're about to tell us just keep an eye on helping us know what you mean by certain things if you can if you use a word and you see space to do so define what you mean by it tell it tell it tell us what the words you're using um mean sorry i can you. hear you i think the connection can you repeat Taye? yes i can I said, when you tell your story now, see if there is an opportunity to define one of the terms that you're using. So for example, if I say, um, Natalia, I'm going to tell you a story about home. Home for me means anywhere that I know I belong. That's an example of just using a concept and then giving a definition to make it clear what I mean when I use that word. 
Did you get? Oh, did you okay. Get Okay. So it's, it's actually just like it's uh it's more become very short and but it's more the context of it. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. Exactly. The context. Home is not outside. Home is inside. It it is a home for me. So. I found I found that that things that phrase when I do a few pasana for 10 days and I cannot write about anything. So that's the things that I can remember after the 10 day of silent retreat. Cannot talk, cannot cannot read, cannot write. Then I just found home is inside you. It's not outside. You cannot find it. You cannot try to found it outside because it's inside. So that's that's the thing that I found. Natalia, I have to say, I did um, my first Vipassana retreat two years ago. And um, as you can see, I really like to talk. So the 10 days of silence were quite a challenge, but I would say I arrived at the same conclusion that that in, in that silence, I, I found a home within me as well. Thank you for phrasing it that way. Home is inside and not without. I like that a lot. Is okay. there, it, it, the, thank you, thank you. Um, would you like to choose who speaks next, who tells the story next? At me, maybe. <laughs> okay. Welcome, Agni. <laughs> Agni. Um, yeah. Um, aku pakai bahasa Indonesia aja deh. Apa ya? I choose authenticity. Authentic. Ya. Yeah. Um, itu sulit juga buatku karena uh, orang-orang mengenal. Aku dengan Agni yang ceria, Agni yang um, mungkin pintar buat sebagian orang, tapi bagiku sendiri untuk menunjukkan uh, ekspresi yang sedih, ekspresi marah itu sulit sekali. Jadi uh, ketika kita mau menunjukkan ekspresi sedih itu, terkadang terhalang sama image-image uh, orang tentang aku yang ceria. Uh, mungkin sebagian dari teman-teman juga merasa kalau misalnya mau nangis ya nangis saja gitu tapi untuk untuk seorang lagi itu sangat sangat sulit ternyata karena uh, terhalang oleh image-image uh, seorang Agni yang kuat dan ceria itu uh, apa ya vulnerability yang aku miliki dan uh, I'm trying to embrace that vulnerability and and being ugly. Yeah. I'm confused. Uh, ya gitu. <laughs> Aku masih bingung mau cerita tentang apa, tapi untuk uh, being authentic, it's hard for some people and yeah, include me because I have to to embrace the image public image of Agni and then yeah I have to accept my vulnerability first before the others yeah that's it Taye <laughs> I I missed a little bit of the um simultaneous translation yeah the uh, translation was not very it, we, it was it was breaking up a lot on Tika's side so Ima Ima, are you still there? Can, can you give a quick synopsis? Uh, tell us a little bit, so if you're able. I'm sorry, I'm not able. It also broke up for me. OK. Um, maybe, oh. maybe I will tell you um, a little. Thank you, Agni. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry I'm to sorry. make you I'm speak no, no, no. Uh, I, I'm trying. <laughs> so I'm Agni with the uh, 
Agni in public image is very nice and very nice person, a kind person, and then um, cheerful. Uh, I have, uh, but I have a vulnerability that I want to show with the others, but it's okay, hard okay. to express um, my sadness, my anger, because that image. Uh, yeah, I have to embrace that uh, yeah. that vulnerability, but it's hard to express it to the other people because that public image of Agni. It's yeah, it's it's my story. It's a little story about Agni, but maybe I I confuse uh, to tell a long story, but the short. Yeah, I have to embrace our uh, my vulnerability. Uh, first, before I talk to the other people, uh, yeah. yeah, I think that makes that makes so much sense, Agni, and thank thank you for sharing that. I know I I went through something very similar, so I wrote this essay about being Afropolitan, and it was quite cheerful, <laughs> and then. I was asked to speak about it in public and I wrote the essay so nobody was you know looking at me but when it came time to talk about it in public I had to do exactly what you just described which is not just be happy optimistic positive intelligent tie but to you 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 named two emotions sadness and anger and I had to get very comfortable speaking in public about my sadness, my anger, my sadness at being alienated and isolated and, and, and feeling completely out of place and context for most of my childhood is the less cheerful side of the experience about which I write in my Afropolitan essay or about the experience I describe in my TED talk. There is a sadness that, that motivates um, El Tushnet when people say, where are you really from? That question was breaking my heart because the implication was always, you're not from here. And it was, it, it was, it was easier for me to analyze the question than it was to speak vulnerably about the sadness that living in that kind of constant scrutiny occasioned. And so I commend you for identifying the, the, the challenge about around presenting sadness and anger, especially as women in public. But I encourage you, as you've said, to, to look to embrace that vulnerability in yourself so that you feel empowered to share it um, on stage. Because it, as I said, it is so transformative for, the, for your listeners. Even listening to you, thank you for your admirable um, recap in English. You, you really touch me by bringing up those emotions. And so if, if authenticity is something that you feel um, led to embrace in your storytelling. Embrace the sadness, embrace the anger, for, for those are human experiences too. And your human audiences will, will see themselves in, in your stories and, and will feel embraced by you as a result. Thank, thank you, thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you, it's really touched my heart. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, would you like to pick the last storyteller to share with us today? Do we have time? Can we squeeze in one more? Okay. Um, but Ruth? Okay. Ruth, coming to us live from Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, um, thank you, Mbak Agni. Uh, I want to address uh, authenticity and brevity, I guess. I try to. Uh, so nine years ago, uh, I applied for a lecturer position in a private campus in Jakarta. When I applied there, uh, the head of the communications department asked me, are you sure you want to be a lecturer? You cannot be rich by being a lecturer. 
And then I was stunned by the by the questions because he was not asking about my experience, about my uh, my competence, my academic background. But he asked, "Are you sure you want to be a lecturer? Because you cannot be rich by being a lecturer." And I asked him back, "Am I going to be poor, homeless, and starving by being a lecturer?" And he laughed, "No." You won't be poor, you won't be homeless and starving by being a lecturer. Then I said, okay then, I want to be a lecturer. That question reminded me of uh, a book written by Bondan Winarno. He was a journalist in Indonesia. He wrote a book uh, called Petang Panjang di Central Park, Long Evening in Central Park. Uh, he told the reader that his mom also concerned about his life as a writer. His mom also asked the same questions. Can, can a writer be rich? Can you be rich by being a writer? How can you provide your wife and your children by being a writer? But uh, Mr. Bondan um, still work on um, his career as a writer. And in the preface of his book, he said, I never be rich because of uh, my career as a writer, but being rich has never been my purpose of life. So am I, being rich has never been the purpose of my life. It's being um, useful to the world as my purpose of life, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Ruth. That writer's mother must know my mother because she always asks that, like, can you actually support yourself telling these stories day in and day out? And one day I told her, actually, I said, I don't know if I can make a living telling stories, but I don't know how to feel alive any other way. And that was pretty much the end of the conversation. I think she finally understood that for some of us, this is just the only way. And are you, did you become a lecturer? I, I am a lecturer now. You are, and yeah, I'm, you are. Yeah, and I'm pursuing my PhD. Uh, so actually that story uh, I just, uh, I just uh, told you guys was a story that I wrote for my personal statement when I, <laughs> when I applied for a scholarship. And that story got me that scholarship. <laughs> Fantastic. No, well, I thought you did a great job of keeping it brief. You know, I went for the interview. The man said this. It reminded me of the story. I would tack on the ending, which is yeah, I, I am now a lecturer and I am not homeless or starving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably a better ending. It's more, it's a climax ending. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> go out on a high note at least not yet as I always say um thank you all so much for spending this time with me it's it's been really lovely listening to your stories very very personally resonant and touching and um yeah I'm very grateful to have spent this time with you thank you so much Taya we got so much out of you know this past hour and a bit um but we still have seven minutes left and I want to eke out as much as we can and I want to open it up first to Abdul Rahman and Ima if they have any comments or questions to you uh, to, to what we've experienced there's there's so many things you know I'm you know uh, one it's where are you really from this this question keeps coming and it's part of our training if if those due to Charita remember uh, you know when they this question is asked to Amin Malouf, who is a French author, and he says, I am French, my parts are, I am French, I am Christian, I am Arab, I am uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are just part of my parts. And so when he, he feels when someone asks this question, it wants to minimize him into this one thing. Uh, it erases so much of who he is and puts it into one thing. Uh, so this kind of dehumanization, this is what is going through my mind. And of course it comes out in this conversation. So, um, but I wanna, as I said, I have a, always, I have a chance to speak to you, Taye. So I wanna open it up to Durhman and Ima and then after to the Duta Charita. Ima AR. 
Ima, why don't you start us off? Okay, thank you so much, Tayeb. I really enjoyed that. And again, it's like hearing your story um, in particular as well um, in how you how you did this workshop by telling your story. And I think that's that's uh, that's that's an art. Um, it's not a, this, it's an art, not a science. Um, but in a way, there was a bit of science in there as well, uh, for me at least. Um, it is definitely something that I, I, I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis as well as we tell our stories. Um, it's 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 always very interesting. You know, it's like we we live in a we we live on day to day in, in, in our daily grind, whatever it is that we do, whether we're a lecturer, whether we're, you know, whether you, um, you know, you teach, whether you work at a desk and share at the computer every single day, or you put out fires, um, whatever it is, it's like, there's always a story behind there. And, um, and earlier, you know, we were, we were talking about how, um, how, uh, you know, how, we are how we were you know people were upset about Reggae Jean not being in, in in the in the second season of Bridgerton but we talked about there's a story and a light a story has has a beginning and 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 an end um and 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 oftentimes you know the end is on is not always the end is not always sad the end is not always the end is not always the end as well and so that i think is 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 so you know just thinking about everything that we've 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 heard this evening i think it's it's such a rich part of our of what we're trying to be as storytellers in our day-to-day -day. but um whether people realize it or not they are storytellers um you know we're, we're we are here trying to hone the craft um and with the help of this workshop with you i think it's been amazing but um, what we realize is every day, you know, in, in the work that we do, we, we hear people telling this, telling a story, whether it is to accomplish something for that day in their job, or whether it is to, wh wh whatever it is, stories surround us. So thank you so much for, for that. I, I would, I mean, if it were up to me and um, I would love to, I would love to continue conversations like these with you um, and, and, and one day hopefully we'll, we'll get that chance. Thank you. Sorry, I was like, thank you. Thank you, Ima, thank you. Yeah, I, I, Taya, I would, I'd would love, to, love to have you back and sort of unpack some of this. It was, it was just, it was, it was brilliant and really, really appreciated the way that these kind of four principles really strike at the, at the very heart of the way in which we tell stories as I'm sure you've gathered from from this group and from your conversations with um, with Stephen, um, you know it's it's it, all of these aspects are are woven in to uh, to storytelling and particularly the, the personal experiences that um, yeah. the Duta Chirita have shared over the past over the past few years. But I'm always a process person, and I love the way folks like yourself are able to bring this into into process right and and, and mm. streamline it and give us structure to kind of focus on the things that we need to focus on and i so i so appreciated that um and also okay. this this idea of, of sort of highlighting and i think for those who are in the room it, it was i i think the challenge that ty was setting for us is a really interesting and I think I think really significant one is that how do we take one of these aspects and almost like microscopically focus on it as yeah. we're telling our story right so that muscle gets trained and I always feel like these are these are four muscles aren't they uh, of, yeah. of, of storytelling and the more we the more we exercise each of them individually just like you do your legs or your arms when you're when you go to the gym for the workout or stretch if you want to get your fascia all pulled in the right place um you know you 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 would you would focus on each of these and really kind of dig down and do do some heavy lifting around each of them so i, so I would encourage i mean myself first of all and, and and all those in the room to think about each of these four aspects as muscles that we're we're sort of exercising and developing and then they as they start to work together we get the kind of uh, you know profoundly compelling storytelling that you modeled for us today, uh, Taye. So it was it was it was, it was it was wonderful. I feel like I feel like this is just the introduction. I know, I know. I wish you could come many, on to many to many conversations for many conversations to come. And I and I hope we can I hope we can have that 
opportunity with you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. It was, it was, um, it was wonderful. My pleasure. I love that idea of, of these uh, concepts as muscles. I might steal that. I will, of mm. course, cite you. No problem. <laughs> Servant of mercy <laughs> told me that these were muscles. Thank you for that. That's fantastic. Tay, I wonder if you have uh, time for a couple questions, comments. We're just two minutes. Of course. Of course. Um, so anybody question, comments? And you can ask me questions about anything. You don't have to ask me questions only about these four muscles. You can ask me yeah. about anything at all. A, B, C. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Any Nobody has questions? any questions for me? Nothing at all? What's the They're digesting, I think. They're, they're... What's my favorite color? <laughs> in, 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 they're in awe. They're oh. definitely in awe, for sure. Um, bang, bang. Oh, well, then I will be honored. Oh, yes. I have bang, a question. Bang. Okay. Okay. Elf. I, I have a question. Okay. So, because I, I love reading books, as you guys know, so I want to ask about, uh, uh, do you, do, how do you use those uh, A, B, C, D on uh, writing fiction? Because, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm not a writer, but sometimes when I want to uh, tell the story, I don't want to reveal everything, but I want, still want the fiction to be, um, to be sparkly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, how do you use uh, ABC on your fiction? With fiction, I exercise mostly A and B and C. Yeah, so, but I start with B and C actually, because, you know, authenticity is something that you can apply to yourself. You can say, am I really telling the whole truth as I know it? It's what I asked you, your, your embrace of cultural ambiguity. Is it, is it all good cheer or is there another side to it? And I ask the same question of my characters. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm doing fiction, I do try to keep the fiction brief. I, I, I don't, I like to pair away. I'm an editor and a cutter. I, I, I believe that it enhances the, um, the text, but the catch then is to make sure that I've left enough that what I'm writing is clear. I think this is actually the thing that I've learned most between writing my first novel and my forthcoming second. It's to be clear, it's to make sure that the, the narrative, the prose, the sentences are clear to the reader, no matter how poetic and sparkly, I like your word, they might be to me. It is of the utmost importance that they are clear to my reader, else I have no business publishing at all. And then the reason I left off D only in the context of fiction is that the dignity that I seek to extend in writing fiction is to my characters. I just seek to dignify their human experiences as best as I can, even though they don't exist in, in the world. Um, that, that is my practice as a novelist. Thank you for your question. Thank you for sharing. Great question. Are there any others? So with that, Taya, thank you so much. It's it's really been full. And I think there is, uh, especially these guys who it's um, now 9, 9 p.m. where they are, you know, I, I, I think there's a digestion going on and we're- Absolutely. I think, I think we need a, another debrief or another few to really, uh, really get to this. But uh, for me, there's, um, you, you looked at kind of skeleton, but, and you looked at guts of, of story. Mm -hmm. And I really, really liked, so mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, feel free to use any of these two. I, I will, you know, I you know absolutely I mean. will. <laughs> but, um, Stephen David Salim. <laughs> I'm gonna I'll only refer to you now by Stephen David Salim. All right. But, you know, it might be difficult in the road. Yeah, it's, it gets long. But I just want to thank you so much from uh, on behalf of all of us for such a, an in-depth look. It's such a short time. It's really amazing. And wishing you the best in these. Oh, thank and you. and there's one person I just want to admit because it's Tika and. Um, 
Thank you, Tika. Tika, for your for your interpretation as well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Tika. If you have anything to ask, comment, now's your chance, final word to Tika. I'm sorry? I Do you have a final you. word? We want to thank you very much for being in our ear. Um, oh, if you, you have the interpretation, guys, that's my final word. I'm so sorry, Tai. I was so wonderful listening to to your story, and I hope um, I hope everyone got to got to listen to it in both languages. It was so thank beautiful. you, thank you, thank you, Tika, thank you, Tika, and thank you, Tai. Pleasure. Thank you both. It was really. I wish <laughs> I wish you all a wonderful evening. <laughs> Just your <laughs> Lovely, lovely. I'm off to bed now. <laughs> indeed, bed. indeed. Sleep well. Ima. Sweet dreams. Thank you all. Thank you, Taya. Thank you all. We'll see everyone Take real care. soon. Okay. Take care. Ciao. Thanks.